Paul Rudnick is here. He is the award-winning author of such plays as Jeffrey, I Hate Hamlet, and The Naked Eye. He's also garnered success for his films, Adam's Family of Values, and In and Out. His latest play, The Most Fabulous Story Ever Told, explores an unusual premise. What if God had created Adam and Steve instead of Adam and Eve? Ben Brantley of the New York Times said, line by line, Paul Rudnick may be the funniest writer for the stage in the United States today, and he confirms that reputation with this play. I am pleased to have Mr. Rudnick here on this program once again. Welcome back, sir. Oh, thank you so much. Nice to have you here. Now tell me, in, in your mind, mm -hmm. where did the idea for this come from? Well, it came from that remark that a lot of biblical fundamentalists like to use, where they say, God didn't create Adam and Steve. He created and Adam and that's about, Eve. Exactly, and that's about the extent of biblical fundamentalist repartee, I think. <laughs> so I thought, take them at their word. What would have happened if, you know? And I thought about the first two lesbians, Jane and Mabel. Yeah. So, and the story kind of unreeled from there. I also wanted to explore issues of faith and God and why they're actually some of the most provocative questions around. I think sex has become so commonplace, you know, thanks to, to Monica and the cigar, that now religion seems one of the only taboos left, one yeah. of the only sort of socially explosive questions. Now, what are the explosive questions? Well, I think if you were at a cocktail party in Manhattan or anywhere else for that matter, and you ask people about their sex lives, they would have no problems. You would get their full therapist's readouts, all far too much information. And then I did this and then he did that. Exactly. But if you ask them, do you believe in God, I think people would become very uncomfortable and perhaps embarrassed and probably very funny because I think it's just, it's a very intimate question. And so what do you say when they ask you, do you believe in God? I say you'll just have to see the most fabulous story ever told. <laughs> my answers don't come cheap. Here is my theory. Your, your God is the theater. I mean, some sense that that has been your God. Oh, absolutely. And even beyond that comedy, I think when I get to stand at the back of a, of a theater and hear an audience roar at, at especially the brilliant cast of this play, it's a transcendent experience. I think that is as close to God as I ever need to be. It is, it is such, it's why live theater will never die. You get that sense where the audience shoots the performers in the play even higher, and you think, my God, these are human beings at their best. But I stole this from one of these profiles of you, so here it comes. What are you gonna do when <laughs> St. Peter says, uh, by the way, Mr. Redding, I have a cassette here where you said you didn't believe in God. Well, it's funny. I was thinking about this because Jerry Falwell the other day also said that the Antichrist is alive and among us today. And he is. And he said that he was a Jewish person. <laughs> and so, of course, I was terribly flattered. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then Falwell, I think today actually apologized to Jews everywhere for this, yeah. but did and not well, retract. He no, he, he said retract. he is still Jewish. But so I think, I don't know what I'll say when I get to St. Peter. I'll probably... Just kidding. <laughs> you know me. <laughs> Just Paul. Exactly. I think of a funny line, and there I go. That's right. So I figure, oh my yeah. God, I'd hope he'd be terribly forgiving. Or Although, I would imagine most of the other people I know will not be around at those that particular pearly gate. So uh, I probably think, uh, not. Yeah. yeah. Now, <laughs> so you start off with Adam and Steve. Right. And, and what happens in the first act? the entire Old Testament, or at least the good parts, the highlights, the juicy stuff. So we go from the Garden of Eden, through the Ark, through the expulsion from Egypt, all the way to a pretty spectacular nativity. And then the second act actually makes a leap to contemporary times yeah. in, in Manhattan, because I wanted to explore how these stories might have begun and what impact they have on people's lives nowadays. You know, what we've made of the Bible, whether it still has relevance, because I think for some people it absolutely does. And those people, the play satirizes everyone, but I think faith can also be something that's, that's very genuine and, and very impressive. So I wanted to really play every possible angle. And when do we get to see the lesbians? They arrive pretty darn fast. Do they really? Yes, they, they're in the garden <laughs> because too. Because Steve and Adam are saying, we're the first. And, yes. the, and the two lesbians whose names are Ma Jane and Mabel. Jane and Mabel are saying, well, not so fast. Exactly. They're claiming we it was here. a women's garden, yeah. although they did have... They meet in the Garden of Eden. They meet in the Garden of Eden, although the women claim they had special nights for other creatures with the discussion groups. <laughs> so they're a bit more PC than Adam and Steve. But eventually everyone makes friends and yeah. they encounter animals and pharaohs and you name it. Is it easy to make comedy 
out of religion. Yes, because I think comedy, or comedy, religion is humanity at its most fervent and its most impassioned and its most sincere. And that makes for rich comic territory because people are very exposed, they're very vulnerable, which also can make for a lot of real emotion, which I hope the play also has, that it's human beings choosing to believe or choosing not to believe. And these are questions that, that you know, whatever your religious position, you have to make up your mind. So it's, uh, that makes people funny. In the end, you find out you're talking about love. Absolutely, because I think that's if I have any other faith, it's romance, <laughs> which I'm sure is just as, as lunatic as any, you know, Koran or Bible or Torah, but I think it somehow is the most positive form of religion for me. I think that's something that really, oh my God, can't, shouldn't go wrong. There has not been a reaction. Terrence McNally, what was the name of his play? Corpus Christi. Corpus Christi got a huge reaction, a, mm -hmm. a, a kind of react against it. Uh, not on the part of critics, but on the part of people who somehow got up in arms about it. Yes? Yes. This hasn't happened with you. No, I think and some why of is those... It different? Right, well, those protesters, I think sometimes they have a little bit of trouble finding their way through downtown streets. I think they were a little exhausted after <laughs> the Corpus Christi <laughs> protests. I think the bus just took them to Atlantic City with a <laughs> cup full of quarters after that. Yeah. But I think also Terrence's play focused on Jesus, and that's more of a real oh, flashpoint for that community. Yeah. And I, I've... Jesus just didn't happen to wander into my particular <laughs> testament. But the, I know the theater has gotten some calls from a group that's very ardent about Our Lady of Fatima. And what they seem to want to know is, why won't Paul Rudnick write a play about Our Lady of Fatima? So I'm going to see what I can do. <laughs> there may be some material there. Exactly. Yeah. I think she sounds swell. Now, coming back to the theater, was this something that inexorably you're going to do because... Oh, absolutely. I don't even think of it as coming back. I couldn't stay away. I'm an addict. It's too, I mean, that's, uh, I think, my greatest pleasure. My, my highest highs have been in the theater. Of, you get to be in the same room as the rest of the, the creative team. You get to be there with the actors, with the director, and it all happens as a group. And movies are such a big deal, and there's so much money involved and so many different skills that it's very rare to get that, that kind of family feeling. But you did very well writing movies. Oh, I've had a blast. You know, I mean, I had a I'm, wonderful time on in and out and the Adams movies you know. and on the film of Jeffrey, so I can't complain. So it's actually, it's, it's a joy to be able to bounce back and forth. You, um, you, you didn't get credit uh, for uh, the Adams family for the first one. For the first one. Even though Scott Rubin gave you lots of credit. Oh, you he, didn't get he a was, line credit because you generous. two are long friends. And yes. then you wrote the entirety of the second one, yeah? I did. I did. Are you writing another screenplay? I am. I have a movie that actually is coming out in the fall called Isn't She Great? That's is? about the author Jacqueline Suzanne. And, and Irving Mansfield. And Irving Mansfield, her husband and publicist. Is this is based on somebody's book about them? It's based on a wonderful memoir by Michael Corda. Yeah, I saw that. that in appeared Yorker, in the New Yorker. In the New Yorker. Yeah. yeah, and it was so affectionate and so funny that it just kind of cried out. And it's directed and by Andrew a, Bergman. She was an interesting character because she, she was, was so... Extraordinary. Yeah, because she was actually far gutsier than people realized. She was a woman who... Far gutsier than they yeah. realized? Well, because she was very she outrageous. She defined gutsiness. She did, but I think people didn't realize for her entire fame, for her full career, she had breast cancer, she yeah, had an autistic right. yeah, child, right. none of which she would exploit or even reveal. You know, I think if she yeah. lived now, people would expect her to be on, you know, Oprah every other day. But she was pretty brave. But she was out there hustling. I mean, she defined the modern book tour. Oh, absolutely. She really created modern publishing in many ways. She turned herself into a brand name so that yeah. people would buy the new Jackie Suzanne. And I think that's led to Stephen King and Tom Clancy and all of those. Don Grisham huge. and the rest of these people. Exactly, you know, the real trademark authors. Trademark names, and everybody's waiting for the next Grisham novel right. as they were waiting for the... Um, do you ever want to act? God forbid. No, Why I'm, I'm too in awe of, of the great actors that I'm surrounded by. When I see what they can do, I wouldn't dream of it. And it's, I always feel so spoiled that I have these troops of players. I'm like the little prince who sits there and says, entertain me. <laughs> but do, you, you also bring with you the same team, or some of the same team, that is in this, was mm -hmm. also in Jeffrey, yes? Oh, absolutely. Chris Ashley, Chris who's directed director. almost all my plays and yeah. is a genius and my absolute partner in, in crime and comedy. So I would not make a move without him. And he just, it's, oh, he also sets such a wonderful rehearsal atmosphere and such real freedom for everyone involved that he's indispensable. Now, do you use the language of the theater somehow in this play? 
Oh, absolutely. It's very much a, a the theatrical technique? trip. Well, it's a way of using a red velvet curtain and yeah. using some elements of even high school plays where everyone's pushing on pieces of the, the manger set. And just those wonderful transformations that are only possible on stage where suddenly someone's in a turban and they're a wise man or they're, you know, the king of Egypt. And you just have that, that audience joy when they're using their imaginations and a few yards of sequin fabric. Before I get to this, you moved to Broadway or you're already on Broadway? We're off Broadway at the Manetta Lane Theater. Yeah, are you moving or you just... You're, no, we just moved from you, a... We had oh, a... You moved from downtown to... From the New York Theater Workshop. To... To the Manetta Lane Theater. All right. And here is a... Uh, this is from... This is where Jane and Mabel, the aforementioned Jane and Mabel, come to Adam and Steve's house for dinner. From the stage, roll tape. A couple of things about you. When you were writing comedy, when you're mm -hmm. writing these, how does it, what's the process? How does it take place? Oh, my God. I live to rewrite, so I go through endless drafts. And I also love to work on the play in front of the audience because that response is so essential and is such an education for me. Because if something isn't quite working, if I can make it funnier, I will be back there with my pencil and my big pen and my legal pad. Because that's, I mean, that's what comedy is about. In fact, even since the move from the workshop to the Minetta Lane, I've taken the opportunity to, to hone the play even a bit further. But in the early stages, I'll do any number of drafts, and then I'll dare to show it to Chris Ashley, my director, and to, you know, shudder while now, I wait for his response. Are you actually nervous about that? Oh, terrified. Are but that's really? why I trust him absolutely. So I think, okay, he'll let me down gently. <laughs> um, and then I'll rewrite a few more times, and then we'll have a reading maybe in my apartment yeah. where we'll just some, invite some actors over. And then I'll rewrite about eight more times, and then we'll have a larger reading at a theater. And so it's a very gradual, very, well, we did a, a workshop of this also up at the, the Williamstown Theater Festival this past yeah. summer. So that was another great opportunity to take a look. But it starts with you putting words on a page. Oh, absolutely. Right. And you sit there and you think funny or you think character. Oh, I mean, character. Well, I also, it never, I never intend to write comedy or satire or anything of the sort. I think I'm writing absolute reality. <laughs> and, which actually, I find your real life... Your reality is funny, though. I mean, your, your reality is that you have the mind that makes it, that sees the humor. I try to. I think that's, that's very much a legacy from my family, which really used humor as, as a real balance wheel and as a kind of a weapon against self-pity, especially. I think if, if you can make something funny, why not? All the better. There's a poignant story about you in that your dad was dying, mm -hmm. and you had written your first thing, and you wanted him to see it, correct? Yeah, this was actually Jeffrey. This was, was my Jeffrey. Yeah. yeah. And he and he died before the play was produced, but he was able to read a draft of it before he oh, died. Oh, he read it. I, didn't, yeah. I, I couldn't figure out whether, when I read that story, whether mm -hmm. you actually had some actors come in and, and just sort of no, act it. No, no. You just oh. had him read it. Yeah. And he loved which, it. He liked it and thought he it was He did funny. very much. He was, and it, I was so, so very grateful that he was able to read it before, before he left. But um, it's funny, because even on, on Most Fabulous Story, there was a, an amazing woman named Helen Merrill, 
who'd been my agent and a very dear friend for since the beginning of my career. And she also died just as the play was about to go into rehearsal. And she was dying of cancer. And actually, Chris Ashley, our director, read the play aloud to her on her deathbed, basically, because she wanted to keep working and she wanted to keep laughing. And that was, it's one of those mixed blessings where I was so thrilled that she wanted to hear the play. And it was, it was very sad that this was as, as far as she'd be able to come with it. But it was, it's amazing just to, my God, you start to realize how, how little time you have. Oh, boy, tell me. When you think about, well, the theme of this is homosexuality and spirituality, spirituality and homosexuality, yes? That's redundant. <laughs> For you it is. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> is, is it because you're gay, because you understand all that they're m much of, of what the gay lifestyle is, because you understand so many interesting people you know who are gay and the way they think uh, about ideas, about their own homosexuality, about so many things, that you continue to write uh, characters who well, are gay. It's funny. I don't ever set out to say I'm writing a gay play. Right. I'm writing exclusively gay characters. I write about people who I consider wildly entertaining funny, yeah. people who will move me people who will make me laugh and i would never dream of condescending to either the characters or the audience to say ah this is only for one group of people this is about a marginal or minority experience i think gay people's lives are every bit as diverse as straight people's lives and i also have straight characters in this play yeah, and, and right, all of my say. work as well so it's You're never a question hetero. exactly i think well i i have a gracious sympathy for your people but <laughs> I, so i i never pigeonhole the work that way you know and i would hope that and i think when audiences come it's funny we've had such hugely mixed audiences every age race sexual preference group gender and it never divides along those kind of party lines. I think it's funny is funny. Yeah. So that I would never want to think that I was uh, being that exclusive. You know, I am absolutely delighted to be gay, and I consider it a gift to be, to be able to write gay characters. And it's wonderful to have that kind of fresh material that hasn't been covered a million times. Also, I think what's I found, especially with this play, is that sometimes when you use characters who haven't been traditionally included, everyone gets a fresh perspective. Mm -hmm. That if you were writing just about Adam and Eve, the audience, gay and straight, would say, we've heard these stories a million times. But when you use gay characters, African-American characters, Asian-American characters, suddenly it's a new story for everyone, and you can explore the big topics, life, love, death, the existence of God, in ways that get everyone thinking. So it's, it's not, for me, it's, I mean, it's not about gay or straight, it's about the characters and what they're going through. And that's, I love that uh, we all go through the same things. Well said. Uh, the play is called The Most Fabulous Story Ever Told, Paul Rudnick, uh, currently running at the Manetta Lane Theater. Thank you, my friend. Oh, Great thank to you see so you. much. Thank you for joining us. See you next time. <laughs>